Assalamu alaikum. Nous allons, avec votre permission, commencer notre séance. La séance est consacrée à l'examen de la gouvernance en matière de pêche et surtout dans les pays ACP. Nous avons une déclaration qui, est, qui a été en discussion au cours de tout un processus, plus d'un an, sur l'appréciation qu'on se fait de ces accords de pêche futurs. Mais, et, et ce que nous souhaitons, et cet après-midi, elle va être adoptée par l'Assemblée. Je crois qu'il y a consensus autour de cela, de l'Assemblée paritaire, parlementaire à ACP, Union européenne, et que, mais elle concerne une politique de pêche commune de l'Union européenne qui n'entrera en vigueur qu'en 2013. C'est une richesse de ces populations qui habitent les zones où il y, 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 y a le fleuve, il y a les lagunes et puis il y a la mer. Donc c'est une activité qui est menée. C'est que ces populations considèrent ces activités-là comme une activité principale parce qu'ils n'ont pas de champ, ils n'ont rien, ils n'ont que l'eau pour vivre. La people come on a hard sea and carry on fishing. Uh, the country does not receive the required you know, benefits. Il y a les navires, et les navires européens des autres côtes là qui viennent perturber la pêche au niveau de nos côtes. On n'a pas le droit d'assécher la mer. Et la grande préoccupation, comment faire de telle sorte qu'il y ait une gestion qui rende durable l'exploitation des ressources halieutiques Comment peut-on faire c'est la question qu'il faut se poser. Je pense que nul n'est attaché à un système donné. Le plus important, c'est l'efficacité. Nous, nous connaissons surtout les droits de pêche fondés sur le, les capacités de, de, de chaque navire et par espèce à pêcher, qui sont mesurées, ces capacités étant mesurées par tonneau de jauge brute ou par jauge brute, c'est-à-dire la capacité physique du bateau. Euh, les quotas. Euh, transférables, individuels transférables, ne sont pas en vigueur dans notre zone. Ils sont surtout en vigueur euh, en Namibie, en Afrique du Sud, dans d'autres pays. Euh, C'est peut-être une approche qui permet de mieux cerner la quantité qu'on pêche. Mind you, government is not a good businessman. So therefore, we encourage privatization. In fact, as I speak to you, we have enacted the privatization law in my country. Monsieur Seth Massinko, Université de Rhode Island, États-Unis. This is headed your way uh, via the external dimension of the EU CFP. Rights-based fishing being the tool of choice, apparently, to achieve capacity reduction. So there's an international push for rights-based fishing. But what does rights-based fishing mean? And here, I think it's very important to understand that although in theory this phrase, rights-based fishing, it could refer to many types of rights, for example, community rights, human rights, territorial rights, but in fact and in practice, the meaning is individual private property rights. That's what we're talking about here on a worldwide basis. And there are a number of names that have been as associated with this. Transferable Fishing Concessions, TFCs, that's the new term by the European uh, Commission. Catch Shares is sort of popular in North America. And then around the world, and the oldest term, Individual Transferable Quotas. Let's go right to the source. And I put on the screen here a very famous book from an international meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland in the mid-1980s called Rights-Based Fishing. This was a worldwide meeting of fisheries economists and in here, they say, 
that individual transferable quotas are one of the great institutional changes of our times, the privatization and enclosure of common resources of the ocean. And this next sentence, I think, is particularly important for people to, to understand. These fishery resources are now mostly the exclusive property of the coastal states of the world, as the previous speaker alluded to. By definition, then, we're not talking about filling a property vacuum, which is oftentimes in the literature. We're talking about replacing one ownership regime with another. And I think that what, what's being proposed here needs to be understood. Around the world, there's a characteristic pattern of the standard prescription for rights-based fishing slash ITQs. And this characteristic pattern I've listed on the screen here. The quotas are given freely to select vessel owners. This is based on catch history, prior fishing history. They're essentially indefinite. They're good forever. They're fully transferable. And they're wrapped in a rhetoric of deregulation and property rights. But these quota shares that are given out, many of the boats that are actually on the water fishing are leasing the quota shares from the people that were lucky enough to receive the initial allocation. So the people that are on the water fishing, they don't actually own anything. They're leasing, and my point, and I'll return to this at the end of my talk, is instead of leasing from private individuals that we gave the access rights to, they could be leasing from us directly the public owners, all right? But at the moment, the worldwide pattern is to let the individuals that we gave the quotas to do the leasing, all right? And I say that this amounts to mandatory wealth forfeiture because nations are being asked to give over their resource wealth. Madame Monica Isaacs, University of Western Cape, South Africa. I'm here to present the case study of South Africa and hopefully what lessons we can learn in terms of what the route South Africa went in reforming the fishing industry through an ITQ system and then through that ITQ system to what extent did that impact on small scale fisheries. Just to give you a sense of what South African fishing industry is, is like, in two, 2010, the landed value of the commercial fishing industry in South Africa was approximately 714 million US dollars. It is the largest fishing industry in Africa, and it is uh, um, 30th in terms of world ranking. So the fishing policy was developed, the business in South Africa got very uh, uh, edgy around what is, how are they going to be uh, seen in this new policy. So vested business interests lobbied with government for quotas to distribute according to the free market principles, arguing competitive allocation would safeguard the prospects for international investment and create stability in the industry. The fishers and NGO organizations um, in South Africa decided that this is not where we we are not going to sit back and and see that our rights are being taken away by fishing companies and we are not we do not have the right to practice our livelihoods so in essence what many of the fishers did is that the fishers together with NGO organizations like Masifundisi and artisanal fishing organization challenge through the legal system, the ITQ system uh, in South Africa. And they brought a class action case to say that they want fishers to be recognized based on their human rights and to be recognized their livelihoods. A positive outcome of this was in May 2007, the court declared that um, these claimants must together with the state develop a new fisheries policy. Amanda! Uh, I want to thank, uh, take this opportunity first to thank the two presenters and it's very interesting in terms of the right-based uh, approach that they face uh, 
person mentioned. Now, the question that I, I want to ask is, you did not say anything about community-based rights. You, talk, you talked about private sector, sector rights. Now, how about community-based rights, particularly in Africa, where I come from, we have lakes like Lake, Lake Victoria, Lake uh, Tanganyika, Lake Malawi. Um, communities have been fishing in those areas for centuries, and uh, up to today, you, people still use canoes and so on, and yet you get motorized boats, so you get commercial you know, commercial uh, fishing. Now, uh, I certainly didn't mean to uh, slight those or overlook those at all. My point was, in a sense, uh, complements what you said. These people that are advocating rights-based fishing are generally not advocating community rights. They're advocating individual private property rights, which may, in fact, dispossess communities. So my response back to you would be be very careful as you proceed you know, down this path and with these debates with the Europeans because uh, generally they're not looking at community rights. Uh, for now, Liberia as a country does not have even the capacity to monitor its you know, national territorial water. Okay, you're going to issue, and that was my point when I said, well, what does it mean to issue private property rights and access to your resources? You would be issuing them, for the most part, in some cases, to foreign fishing companies. They've got the catch history. Why would you do that? And why would you do that especially before you can add a, yes, I saw that. <laughs> why, why would you do that? Uh, money makes the world go round. Um, but if you then can't mo effectively monitor, this is, this is very dangerous stuff you're playing with. This is one area of investment where the returns are so you know, easy to, to see. It's a good investment because no one has more at stake than companies. Without the resource, there's no company. So it's in the company's best interest to invest for the future. The World Bank has now formed something called the Global Partnership for Oceans. They aim to raise 1.5 billion US dollars in capital to inject into the pursuit of reformed uh, ocean governance. And one of the primary areas is reform of fisheries. And on the screen now is a, is a page from their discussion paper, which was put out uh, a little bit earlier this year. And the second activity they list is, and here I'm quoting, investments in governance reforms and innovative best practice examples in priority ocean areas around the world to support rights-based fisheries management. They have statements about sustainable fish stocks and rebuilding fish stocks, but even the opening statement about rebuilding fish stocks says, via economically rational strategies involving secure long-term access rights, so it's a very property rights oriented approach. LC Ocean translates into economic growth and development. This is parliament, we are parliamentarians. Believe me, we have enormous power to, to hold governments accountable if the wherewithal is there. But too much concentration is being put on the executive which is doing direct business with those who are going to our areas. So I always feel that the civil society and parliamentarians, if we are really capacitated in the way our powers are contained in our constitutions, most of these things will be highlighted, most of these things will be, will be, will be uh, oversighted. C'était le dernier orateur, donc nous allons arrêter à ce stade les interventions. Et, uh, de ces côtes là sont en voie d'être privatisées et ce qui n'est pas du tout bon pour, pour ces pays là puisque c'est les eaux c'est des propriétés de l'état we don't wish for anybody to come and uh, ravage it for us you know so we'll advise that uh, the bigger players see reason not to come and exploit our weaknesses but rather to help us to enhance the, 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 the capacity that we lack 
by building our capacity so that uh, we'll reap the benefit of what God has given to us. Thank you.